Hi, everybody. Welcome so much to um, our new webinar, our new webcast. Are you teaching your students to speak digital? Um, please, as usual, keep all your questions in the chat. Make sure that you're asking all your questions um, and saying a little hello to us. Um, for now, I'm just going to pass over to our moderator for the day, Georgina Dean. Good evening or good afternoon and welcome. I'm really excited uh, to be supporting the BETCAST today. Are you teaching your students to speak digital in the new normal? And I'd like to welcome our panel for this evening. And so I'd love to go around the table, the virtual table that is, and just uh, let everybody introduce themselves before we dig to our very exciting topic today. So Donna, maybe we could start with you if that's okay. That's absolutely fine. I'm Donna Shaw. I am an Assistant Digital Learning Advisor for Cognito Schools. Uh, I've just been one year into that role, uh, although I've been in the education sector for around 20 years now, with a focus on tech probably for about the last eight or nine specifically. Uh, with Cognito, we have just over 70 schools uh, globally. Uh, that's majority in the UK and spread over Europe. And right now we're in the middle of a one-to-one -one program across Europe where all our students from year three upwards are having their own individual device uh, and, and making that change to digital learning wherever they are at any point. Uh, so I'm a Microsoft Innovative Educator Fellow for the London and Central region. And I've been doing that for several years now. Uh, and, and on the side of my free time, I'm actually a, a master's student because I'm studying uh, an MA in digital education. That's wonderful. Well, we're really excited to have your expertise here this evening. So thank you very much for joining. And uh, maybe we can move over on my uh, screen over to Manisha. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Manisha Mystery. Um, I'm head of digital culture within Rolls Royce. Um, and so my responsibility is around how do we take some of the digital capability, skills, practices, and methods that our our high digital and data community have within our Square Data Lab and enable that to proliferate within the organization and build the literacy up. So ensuring everyone can find an on-ramp and gain those skills, feel confident in using them and bring them to bear within Rolls-Royce as an organization as whole. So that's our 55,000 population that sits across the globe. So a fun job. It doesn't just look at the skills. It doesn't just look at the tech. It's also about the environment and the communities and how do we make sure everyone feels that they've got someone they can go to or somewhere that they can go to to practice, gain those confidences and bring it into the role that they do today. Wonderful. Well, we're also very excited to have uh, your wealth of experience here today. So thank you for joining us, Manisha. And uh, we'll move down uh, below the panel. Mark, would you like to go next? Yeah, thank you, Georgina. Uh, hi, my name's Mark Vickers, and I'm Head of Digital Learning at the Royal Hospital School. Um, and we are uh, an independent co-educational boarding school in Suffolk in the United Kingdom. Um, we've got about 700 pupils. Uh, we started our digital journey back in about 2014, um, when we went one-to-one -one with iPads. Uh, and since then, we've uh, become part of the Apple RTC program. We've gained the 360 degree online safety mark, um, which is a, a UK recognised qualification for um, good practice in terms of digital safety. And we were part of the 2019 EdTech 50 for our kind of digital innovation uh, in the classroom. Um, so we've managed to achieve quite a lot over the last few years. Uh, and all of that meant, meant we were in quite a good position to, I guess, meet the challenges of the last year or so, um, which has obviously been sort of great in their number. Um, in terms of my role, it's kind of twofold, really. It's to ensure that, that our teachers and our pupils are making the best use of digital technology in the classroom to kind of benefit their education, but also to make sure that our pupils have got the skills that they're going to need when they head out into the workplace to make the most of the opportunities that they might have when they leave school. Okay. Wonderful. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. We're very excited to hear from your journey as well, and congratulations to you and your community. Uh, Neil, are you ready? I hope so. Uh, I'm, I'm going to first of all apologise because I can hear my kids have just come in from school. So, um, you know, they uh, I, I'm not sure uh, how well behaved they are at this time of, uh, of the evening. So I'll, I'll try my hardest. My, my name's Neil. I, I work for Hewlett Packard and uh, I've worked in the education technology space for, you know, just coming up for 20 years. I work very closely with, with Microsoft and, and Google on 
you know, the, the, the uh, shared ecosystems that, that we support schools and colleges on. And, you know, look, most importantly, um, you know, I'm, I'm not an education expert, but, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time learning, you know, some of the, the, the great, um, you know, skills and, and knowledge that, that all of you on the call um, have, have been able to educate me on. And, you know, what we try and do is just help design the right technology for you all. Well, we are very excited to have you here, Neil, and we appreciate uh, you being here as well as your family. This is all what this is about, right? The new normal and how are we all surviving and thriving together? So I absolutely love it. Uh, and welcome to our viewers who are joining in. Thank you for taking the time. I know that it's coming close to the holiday season. So if you are tuning in um, this afternoon uh, from the UK or abroad, then welcome to today's episode. My name is Georgina Dean, as um, Ellen Sarah introduced earlier, and I'm joining you all the way from a man, Jordan, in the Middle East. Um, it is just gone 6 p.m. here in my evening, so we're a few hours into your future if you're in the UK, and I'm working as Director of Learning Technology for an international K-12 British school here in Amman. So I'm supporting the school with their digital transformation from infrastructure to training to blended uh, learning online learning support and all of those amazing things. So I'm really excited to dive in today's topic today. Let's get started then with our first uh, very important question is what we actually mean by digital skills. So it's really, really important to define what those are, what do they look like and how they actually relate to the workplace. Um, so who would like to get us started? What do we mean exactly by digital skills? Well, I, I can start if, if you like. Um, never afraid to, 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 to give an, an, an opinion from, from um, you know, a, a technology employer point of view. Um, you know, digital skills are, are whatever, you know, people decide, uh, you know, to, to, to make of them. I mean, from, from our point of view um, as an employer, you know, digital skills are very important to, you know, set out the career paths um, for tomorrow and, and, and of course, the the years are ahead of us and you know that could be anything of course where we see coding being a, a an integral skill for, for many career paths of the future it could be around of course design uh, that that will lead into very interesting areas like 3d production that will be a big part of the uk uh, economy in the future and you know ultimately it, it's anything from from our point of view that will contribute towards the career paths and experiences that a student needs to make sure that they are equipped and ready to to enter the working world uh, in the future i love that and it is so important right guys in this new normal do we actually know what the jobs are that exist that are going to be existing in the next five 10, 15, 20 years. And so Neil's right, what are we doing to equip the learners that are going to be graduating from our education organizations to be able to thrive in the new normal with jobs that don't yet exist? And so digital skills, what do we think guys? Does it incorporate just those technical skills that they learn on devices or does it encompass a lot more than that? Feel free to hop in with any ideas. Yeah. I was going to say, I think it encompasses a lot more than that because you've got to think about the, the life skills as well that are involved with digital. So even just things like accepting and recognising that there's fake news out there, our students will automatically believe what, what's put in front of them. So we've got to give them those skills to be able to identify and, and at least at the very least check what, what content's out there, what news, how they can try and look for the, the tips that make that it's not quite right, there's something not, not right there. But also thinking about as they go through life, you've got to think about online banking, shopping, being able to access medical care. Quite a few people are, are actually, they're blocked from accessing those right now because they don't have the skills as they go, go forward. So we need to make sure that our students have those too. And then we can start touching and thinking in all those, the six C's, the seven C's, things like your collaboration, your creativity, your computational thinking, being able to take a problem and break it down into its different chunks. And, and then addressing each one individually. It's all those skills that, that's built into the curriculum that doesn't necessarily come on computer science and coding and the traditional IT skills. 
it threads throughout life and it should thread through through the curriculum as well. No, I think I can absolutely concur with what you've just said there, Donna. I know um, when we think about it and some of the the conversations I have when we talk about digital and digital skills, as I, I say, it's not it's not that it's the culture of understanding new ways of doing things how are you challenging the norm it's being bold it's also about the methods the way we do things and changing that so that you can have a basis of always being curious and that way when the skills change when the technology changes which seems to be happening faster and faster these days you're already ready you're already in a space of acceptance and acknowledgement of looking at how you can approach that opportunity and go seek the help or get what you need to then bring that into whatever you're doing so that not waiting for it to be on a plate and serve to you as much as what is it and how do I then make it applicable to me yeah I, I love that. that I think that having that that skill set that they're going to need when they leave school particularly from our perspective and I think one of the things that's really interesting is that you can put an iPhone in front of the kid and they can do the most amazing things with it but then if you throw a laptop in front of them all of a sudden what some of them are completely lost and it's about being able to to translate those skills as well across devices and make sure that they can apply all those skills in kind of different areas of their life as they as they move forward as Donna said it's not just about necessarily the industry that they're going to go and work in but it's about those day-to-day -day life skills that they're going to need as, as so much of our society becomes more and more digitally based. I love that and I love that idea of translation, right? How do we translate those skills? It's a little bit like a language, right? And so being an international educator, we talk about being able to translate between the local and international communities we deal with and it's the same with those skills. So what are we thinking, uh, everybody on the panel today? How as schools, how can schools um, build those skills into their wider vision and their leadership strategy? What are your thoughts on that to help the education leaders uh, joining the call today? I think to start is you, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mark. <laughs> I know, it's just hands up and all the rest of it. I think for starters, you need to have the schools need to, um, to take ownership of this and have somebody within their leadership team that is maybe an SL team member. It shouldn't fall directly down to, oh, it's the computing teacher, it's the IT leader. They should be the one that drives it through the whole school. You have to lead from the top and, and, and have it then built into a digital strategy. Because I know at, with Cognito, our schools, have that each school has their own SLT sponsor for our red tech strategy but they also own their own vision they've come up with that themselves with support and then they've got the extra input as needed but it, it's taking ownership so they can drive it within their own school and model from the top I think that that's one way that you need to get get started yeah I, agree. I love that it's definitely about that kind of key person who's, who's leading things but also just engaging all of your staff from the very beginning. So from your governors through to your SMT, your middle management, your hearts and your classroom teachers, make sure everybody's engaged. And that there's that, that clear vision that Donna says in terms of sort of strategic planning um, that you've got in place in terms of devices, training, timetable provision, things like that. They all have to be in place in order to move forward. Um, and quite often in schools, I think the focus is on exam results and, and the ability to kind of churn out pupils achieving great grades but there's also obviously that responsibility to develop these more sort of well-rounded pupils these young adults that we can't aspire to develop and I think digital skills are part of that and they sit in alongside things like PSHE and thinking skills and that kind of area certainly they do for us and we run something in in our lower school in year 789 called the compass curriculum where people do things that are sort of slightly outside of their normal um, kind of academic lessons uh, and digital skills are a big part of the compass curriculum and they spend time in, in that part of the school learning about that and then again at the top end of the school we've got something called RHS plus uh, for our sixth form pupils which is all about focusing on the skills they'll need once they leave school and again digital plays a big part of, of that kind of carousel process and, and looking at how they can create a digital presence online uh, and understand how important digital is for their future. I almost wonder whether there's also an opportunity in this of allowing your students to be part of that too and and having them sit on the boards or to represent their own their own voices um in how that's delivered back into so almost the the whole concept of reverse mentoring but in that digital practice of saying we're the end users but actually why aren't we here helping to shape what it looks like too 
because if your advocates are within the community, there's more chances that they prove to become successful as programs of working themselves. And it gives them a really good thing to be tied into and a motivation to say that I, I, I add value back into the, the education system by being the educator in some way, you know, by, by lending what I, my real life experiences of some of this stuff is so that whatever is shaped is shaped with that in mind. Because I think as adults, as as those of the generation of our own times, we forget we forget how much it's moved on. You know, we've just mm. talked about children. My five-year-old can work the iPad better than I can. I can tell you that for certain. And I think we're all in that experience of seeing our children move so much quicker at the adoption of stuff compared to us. So how can we actually use that in our to our game? Yeah. And I think that's where voice of the student becomes really important because as they're moving on, you've got to, you've got to grasp on that and their skills and have things like digital leaders within your schools who it is happy and it should be part of the norm and the culture that it's, it's okay for students to do some teaching to the teachers on how to use some of these tools. Because at the end of the day, they are the ones that we're trying to become creators rather than just consumers. So it, it is changing that culture of the whole environment and making sure that the, the different you know people have the the opportunities. Yeah, I, mean, I love the. Go ahead, Mark. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah, just reflecting on what Donna and Manisha have said there. We've got uh, an e-council at school, as an example, um, which is a group of pupils taken from various uh, groups across the school boarding houses. Is actually the way that we do it as a boarding school, and um, we we invite them to come along once a half term and sit down and and talk about some of the issues that we're facing in terms of digital skills and the provision of digital across the school. Uh, and they contribute to the direction that we're heading in. Yeah. And that's a, I think it's really important that they do that. Mm. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I love all of these ideas coming in. And also a shout out to our, our viewers and the audience, guys. We have loads of participation coming in the chat. I uh, wanted to shout out to uh, James Richards, who was sharing on having a wide variety of, of skills from accessing devices and software also to accessing information, but reaching out on other digital platforms as well, um, which ties us in really nicely to our next question about how do we actually get our devices into the hands of teachers and actually keep up regular CPD that's going to help them in their utilization of the technology that is available to them. So what are your thoughts on that? And if you're tuning in in the audience, please also feel Feel free to share your thoughts on how we can get um, devices out into the community. And also, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them for our panel there. Donna, I well, know you had a few uh, ideas if you wanted to get us started. Yeah, well, I, I know obviously there's, there's lots of schemes going about, like one to one schemes that we're, we're participating in. There's things like bring your own device schemes, but of course this isn't possible for, for every school. There's a lot of people out there that don't have access to those sort of schemes. So it would be great if, if you could get in contact and to develop links within your local communities, maybe getting businesses on board so you can recycle and upcycle devices as they, they move through them and, and start to, shall we say, dispose of them when they, they buy new. It would be great if they could be brought into schools so that they can have devices. But equally, we need to think about, especially when we went into this period of like emergency remote learning in the first instance, students often have devices in their homes that you can still tap into, things like using Xboxes, using Playstations. If it's got a web browser, your smart TV, you can still access things like Microsoft Teams, you can still access the Google Chrome platform. So they could still get on board and have these devices in the hands of the students. So with respect to that, there's lots of different things you can go about doing to, to try and get the maximum access to devices within the school. Um, but then thinking about the ongoing CPD, I know we developed our own little online platform and we've got various training things that are going on there. We've got videos, uh, we've got click through demos so that staff can access that in their own time whenever they need to. Because we realise that we've got thousands of staff that need training, they can't access it and sit in front of a webinar live go through it have the chats face to face and i certainly can't get into every school that we have so doing it via that platform they can take it when they all want to in their own self-paced but we've also taken it a step beyond just the basics and we've developed uh, beyond the fundamentals where it's more how we then put them into practice using things like um the next one coming up is all about digital inking so looking at the benefits of digital inking the impact it has in your schools last month it was all about community so we start off with a little a little webinar like we're doing now 
get some guest teachers in because our teachers and the staff want to see each other. They don't just want to see the, the leaders doing things. They want to see what it's like in, in, in practice in the classroom. And then we follow that up with a slow Twitter chat because I think that's another way that you can get on board with, with community and building CPD is, is hooking into social media and seeing what's out there. There's a whole range of, of things that you can do. And uh, obviously, I'm a Microsoft fellow, so I've got to say about the education that they have at, at the Microsoft on the Microsoft Education Centre, a really great community to be a part of. Uh, and I know it's the same with, with the Google Educator community as well. They've got their, their groups going as well. And it's, if you haven't looked, something to explore. It's really good for, for CPD in your own time as well that's applicable to you. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I could probably add to that, in, you know, in terms of the, the, you know, how can we get devices into the hands of, of, of teachers and, you know, students and, you know, it goes without saying that, you know, not every school can afford to buy brand new technology every couple of years. And I mean, it, it is, it's really challenging. Um, you know, that there are some very good initiatives that uh, are not always particularly promoted uh, very well. Um, HP and, and, and other um, manufacturers actually have a, a system called uh, a refresh program where you can take any old laptop, um, whether it be, you know, a Chromebook or a, a Windows device, and you can refresh that with a Windows 10 image free of charge. All you need to do is Google the HP refresh program. It's a global program. I know there's lots of international um, schools and educationalists outside of the, uh, the the sphere of the United Kingdom uh, on this call. I really, really encourage you to look at initiatives like that because they work, they make a difference. You can mobilize a, a community project, as Donna mentioned, to collect old devices and that will get devices into, into staff and, and students' hands, hands down. I think some of the other comments that have been there on um, on the on the chat pages is you know, in terms of accessing the digital skills, I mean, there's some amazing stuff on LinkedIn and, you know, other mm. great repositories that, that will talk about, you know, how to apply digital skills, not just in the in the in the class space, but how then it applies in, in the workspace as well. And I think the point around digital savviness and being, you know, aware of security and, you know, all the other aspects of, of, of having to be conscious of, of a digital world is is something that, that you know genuinely that the, the corporate community looks to create but they're not that great at promoting it and you know if, if i can just give you a couple of tips the hp refresh program will when you're in in the right direction along with linkedin loads of stuff on there as well Thank you for sharing that, and I couldn't agree more. Professional learning networks and knowing where to go to be able to find the answers to the questions that are going to support us in our communities are really so important. We had a few questions coming in the chat as well, so please feel free to hop on to any of our panelists um, as they're coming in. And it is related around access and number of devices per students. How could we possibly support um, families who may not have access necessarily to the internet at home, or maybe sharing devices um, between siblings or even one-to-many devices in the classroom. What are some of the things that have been working well in your communities that we might be able to support our viewers with today? That, that would suggest we all have access to the internet. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a challenge to answer from my, from my point of view, if, if, I'm, if I'm honest. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, it, there are, you know, lots of, of, of resources that, um, that are available that, that you can do offline. You can learn a lot of coding and, you know, design and development um, offline um, without access to, to the internet. Um, but, you know, it is it is a challenge and, you know, that there are a lot of, you know, clearly United Nations driven projects to, to give, you know, communities that, that don't have the privilege of, of, of Wi-Fi and web access, the, the opportunity to, to do that. But, you know, there, there are offline things you can do. I, I think, you know, really, you know, that's maybe something that we should take away and, um, you know, put together a few um, elements that uh, we might have learned from from other other conversations and, and other markets that um, tend to share that same problem. 
I would agree. I definitely think it is a, a global issue that's happening, um, you know, everywhere in the world. There's probably at least some place somewhere in some country that doesn't have access, right? And so it's how can we work together and pull together in these challenging times. So fear not all of you in the audience. I believe everybody globally is working really hard um, to get those uh, to get those problems started to work towards solutions for them. Um, okay, let's take a look at some other areas that we wanted to discuss and share together today. Today, also about empowering students at schools like K-12 schools on um, taking on more of a leadership role. So how do we empower students to become the teachers, to become empowered leaders and take more ownership of their learning? What are your thoughts on that? And I know, Mark, you wanted to uh, share a few ideas to get us started. Yeah, I think this is something that we kind of referenced uh, slightly earlier on when we were talking about things like uh, the e-council idea and the idea of pupils taking ownership of the direction of travel within the school um, on a digital front um, and also the idea of digital leaders um, in terms of training. So we've, we've for a few years operated a, a digital leader system where we have pupils that we think are particularly skilled in terms of their digital technology use uh, and we've asked them to go and work with other pupils within their year groups and across the school in developing those digital skills that might be older pupils working with younger pupils or pupils working with other pupils within their year group. Um, at developing their skills. Uh, and that's something we found really valuable and definitely results in those people's sort of feeling more empowered about their, their digital ability. Um, and then the other aspect of that, I think, is the, the career side of things and ensuring that you've got contact with those, those companies and institutions that people might go on and work for and that they're coming into school and they're explaining to people how important the digital skills are and the, the, the skills that they might need in the future um, if they want to work in that particular industry. Uh, and we do have a lot of, of employers coming into school or in recent times delivering kind of online chats to our people, talking about um, the industry that they work in and the skills that are required to be successful in that industry. And obviously digital plays a, a big part in that. So I think that, that's a really good starting point. Well, it actually brings to mind, I was, um, I was fortunate to, to be at a, a meeting somewhere. I can't even remember where it was, but we had um, the guys from Playground Games. They just done the floors of four and they came in and they were, the number of careers involved in, in that department, it blew my mind away because that's not something I was thinking about. All the artistry and the digital artwork that went into that. I hadn't even considered that sort of aspect within the, the games role. So for our students, it's great getting, getting companies like that involved where you can. And it sounds like you've got that really set up well, Mark. But I wanted to add about um, how students can personalize their learning as well because that's part of taking their ownership and using some of those tools that are built into the devices, things like using your immersive reader, using Translate, using the dictate button even, just allowing your students to use that. That can offer some of our maybe reluctant writers the opportunity to get a whole story finished. Whereas, you know, I'm thinking of our younger writers here and just using that and listening back to it. And I, as an adult, still use, I use those tools now in my assignments because my mind sometimes works far too quickly. So I will dictate an essay and then get it read back to me and then correct it that way because I'm not one that can just sit and write. I need to, to be oral. I need to get, get listening back to it as well. So I use those tools myself and I actually model that when I'm, when I'm in class as well that I use those tools. And it, it's even down then to think about the ownership of using videos. Why can't we use tools like Flipgrid then to, to get video content made and allow our students to be using that uh, using that content and that method of, of showing their learning. Everything doesn't always have to be written down on paper or in a digital notebook. Why can't we have video content to show a deeper level of depth of learning? The things you can demonstrate and talk about that you can't necessarily put down in a sentence with ease. You can say something in, in five minutes that would take 20 minutes of writing down. Why aren't we using that more in our schools? Why aren't we using it in the classroom? Uh, and giving that ownership back to students so they can present their learning in whichever method suits them. Why are we just expecting just written writing all the time? I think we need to explore those different different ways of presenting work as well for learning. 
I couldn't agree more. The multimodal is so important and making sure that we can support, you know, learners of all um, of all levels. And so accessing all the different multiple intelligences by using different modes, right? And so we talk about that ed tech agility and that flexibility with a variety of different strategies and technical tools. So that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing, Mark and Donna. That's great. And feel free, Neil and Manisha, to hop on in whenever uh, you'd like to add to that. Um, we had a question in uh, the chat as well from our audience. So I'm going to drop that in as well. We had a question about what would we see or expect in primary schools? Uh, not really sure if from the um, the audience that's related to devices or learning, but maybe we can just give some general support on what, what we could do to support in the primary level. Certainly, it's down in, I, I taught computing, so I used to teach computing. And I taught that from year one to year six. Uh, but also I used to go into nursery and I, quite often we would use some of the remote controlled cars, getting down with the technology, even down to things like B-Bots when you can introduce coding, but using more hands-on. So it, I wouldn't necessarily introduce technology and, and devices for use of coding at that age. I would get the concepts embedded first and barefoot computing is a fantastic resource to get those skills and the concepts embedded with your with your learners, especially the younger ones. But uh, yeah, I introduced my year ones were, were working on Teams, they were working using all the office tools. And as I said, we would use the dictate function rather than having to type necessarily. And then they'd use immersive reader to listen back. They're quite fluent in using videos. Um, I'd expect them to to get get to grips quite quite quickly. Uh, and become creators. So they would use Movie Maker. So on our, our new devices, we'll flip them around, turn them into the cameras and video cameras. So yeah, they would make their movies. They would do their English language, English lessons and create content that way. Um, so certainly in primary, little, little tiny primaries, I'd expect that. And then they're moving up into to the coding and Scratch and Python and things um, with the old students. I do, I do think that with this space, um, so we've done quite a lot of work where we've introduced very hands-on, and I think you're absolutely right, Donna, it's all about that hands-on, understand the concept of what it is rather than checking you straight into the technology. But there's something about doing it collectively, um, and it's, it's a point that's been raised on the chat as well. Let's not forget parents, guardians, communities, and and how they might be able to either help by learning the, with the individuals and the children, but also, more importantly, how they can themselves start to grow confident and not fear some of the technology and the bits that are around them as well. Because I think all, all too often you find that you get these gaps and they can then actually create bigger problems when, when those children are either seeing it into the education system or beyond, actually, when I think about it. And that's a huge help because we're all stretched with time or resource or money and some of this doesn't need that. It really doesn't. It's about being very um, innovative with what you already have around you. It's about making use of some of the dead tech and taking it apart and understanding what what it even what it's even made of. You know, I think we forget the basics of what we have around us and how it works, mm -hmm. and then the future technology of when it all becomes invisible and you know algorithms start doing everything. And you don't really know what that is. It, there's a there's a fear factor that can be helped. And mitigated against if you bring the broader sense of that networking community together and i think you've just done it between mark and yourself in the fact that sharing ideas between schools um you know we all know only what we know of, and actually i think within the whole school network there's so many amazing initiatives that people are doing that finding a way of being able to better harvest that i think would be would be fantastic for parents for students and for teachers to then all come in together to, to get. Yeah, I mean, I, I was going to uh, just just add to that. I mean, this is probably the reason why we missed the BET show, uh, because actually one of the things that I'm, I'm so fascinated about is, is all the amazing innovation that um, many businesses come up with in terms of delivering those liter literacy skills that, that, you know, the skills even, you know, into the primary sector. You know, I, I look at, you know, some of the things that inspired me earlier this year uh, in the world where we could, of course, visit the Bet Show. You know, some of the, the mm. work around athletics, um, you know, my children are all of primary age and, you know, I'm, I'm sort of fascinated by, you know, actually their literacy around digital. You know, yes, they're learning 
you know, maths as a subject, but, but introducing digital skills and literacy into that, I, I just think it is, is excellent. And, you know, I, I think, you know, some of the things that you can look at, um, you know, if you're looking for ideas, is um, one of the best resources to look at um, in terms of primary solutions and secondary solutions. Go and look at the, the BET awards pages from uh, the last two or three years. Click on the primary software winners and the people that were shortlisted. That will give a access to some of the great things that can be done. And Google some of them and work with the educational specialists out mm. there uh, in your markets, in your countries, that, that can actually deliver those solutions because they are brilliant and they'll really inspire you, the, the websites that you can see uh, through the best awards. I always do a little bit of um, digital cheating every year and uh, look and see who's doing a really good job so that we can we can partner with them and um, and bring some value back into the classroom. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing on the, the collaboration, uh, Neil, and also Manisha, I couldn't agree more. Um, I know our next question that we wanted to tackle was all about including our parent stakeholders. So thank you for bringing up that very important um, point, Manisha. And I really liked what you said. It's really a team team effort, you know, in order for them to be successful, our students inside the classroom, and it's really a community effort. What other um, advice would you like to give um, education and education leaders as well as the parents to educate our wider learning community about the importance of also digital literacy uh, what do parents actually need to know what would what advice would you give schools that could help them get that out there to them I, I mean sorry go on no, no well, I was going to say that I, I'm, I'm a new parent right so I have two very young children um, and and so in that, I'm learning every day and it's really scary. I've gone from a position where I think I'm as knowledgeable as I need to be to manage myself and, and those that are close to me to now feeling like, oh God, I'm not going to be able to answer the questions that they may have. Or actually, they'll surpass me really quickly, as has been the case in some of the things that we do. And that's an OK place to be. And I think there's something about removing the fear factor of digital and what does that mean? And all too often, and I take it from the role of the employer now as well, that we're trying to upskill a workforce who feel threatened by this. And that's in a working capacity, let alone in a home-based environment where your children have these new needs because of, of the situation we're all in now that will persist. Um, and so there's a real feeling of, in, not inadequacy, it's the wrong word, but, you know, a sense of I can't give what I know I need to do and it's already been hard enough to do what I was expected to do as a parent and so there's something about allowing parents guardians and a broader community of those that provide that support network um just to, uh, we're here we, we understand and we, we want to help but we've got to clear some of those signals there's so much out there that makes it so hard to know what to pick what not to pick so you know Neil's suggestion already is brilliant how you know how can you really connect those those community members together and make sure they don't feel alone don't don't feel like they're trying to do this by themselves and that's you know we've got to remember most people do actually own a mobile phone and there is a lot of communities that are built with whatsapps and networks and social media use them you know don't be mm. afraid to use those net social networks that are formed um through you know friendships as opposed to mandation because you're part of a group or you're part of this how can we be smarter using those methods to connect people together so that they can come together and work it through rather than feeling like it has to be a big initiative a big a big program out there i just wonder whether there's something in that community building and connecting in that way i couldn't agree more we just actually um launched our whatsapp uh, communication uh, at our school for our parents. And so we created those um, groups for parents to connect to support each other, exactly like you're suggesting, Manisha. And it's it's just you. We just launched it uh, last month. And so far, it's been going really well. And so I love what you said. And I think, can we be brave uh, in the community to take those risks and to encourage and to support and share in that way? So yeah, I, I love that idea. And thank you for sharing. Mark, I know you wanted to add on to that too. So please feel free. Yeah, I was just going to say that trying to bring parents along 
uh, kind of on the journey has been something that we've been conscious of at school, definitely. And one of the things that we've tried to do is to, to deliver sessions to parents alongside parents' meetings that we've run. So we run parents' meetings, obviously, for, for year groups throughout the year. And usually tagged on to, to that parents' meeting is a meeting about, is a presentation about an element of the school and quite often it's it's due with digital literacy and so just communicating clearly with parents about what we're trying to achieve with the pupils what the the, uh, the relevance of the digital skills they're learning are what the importance of the device that we've given them is and that sort of thing and then um, we, we found that really useful in terms of opening up that channel of communication with parents obviously we don't we don't always get every parent attending but the ones that do i think really take something from it and find it really useful I know, I know something we've, we've done in the past as well is we've opened up, the, I know it's not the same now, but we opened up the doors to the school and, and, and actually invited the parents in to see what their children were doing. Because quite often they would feel that they're being left behind and, and they, they're not sure their children are coming home saying we've done this, we've done that, and they, they can't relate to it because it wasn't part of their own learning. So actually bringing them in and having them involved in the classes or even just seeing some projects on the go getting the students all to, to learn, you know, to, to talk with their parents and with the, the families and community groups, getting them to show what they've been doing and how they've gone through about that learning. That's a great process to get your families involved in too. I love that. So families, families, communities, communities. We had some comments in the chat, guys, about that whole idea of there still being a bit of fear. Although there's this been brilliant silver lining um, through an unfortunate pandemic of COVID of everybody upskilling on that digital front, are there still a, a number of you know, staff at, at the schools, are there still a number of parents in the communities that really have that fear of technology and how can we help them feel not so scared or left behind while some people have, you know, gone at speed 10 and, and, and we don't want to make, we want to make sure everybody's feeling included and um, supported. Any advice on that one? I think, I think it's about having the, the kind of people in school that they can go to and turn to for help. We've, uh, we've obviously been doing this for, for six years at RHS, uh, since about 2014 when we rolled out those one-to-one -one iPads. So it's been going on for a while now, but there are still staff members who've been there throughout the duration or staff members that are new to the school who do find it daunting, they do find it challenging, and um, particularly over the last 12 months or so with having to learn Teams. Um, we've recently started using OneNote a lot more uh, within our lessons, things like that. And having to upskill and, and learn those programs, they have found it difficult, but I think through having uh, a kind of digital champions program in our staff, where we've got a number of staff, almost one per department, who, who we've identified as somebody who is really skilled and has the ability to lead and to train others, uh, then just having those people in place enables those staff members to seek help when they need it. Um, and just making sure that, that the help is there and it's always on hand. We, we offer a clinic uh, once a week on a Friday uh, for staff to come along and get the extra support that they might need. Um, and just that sort of thing, just making sure that the help is always there. It is difficult and it is a very challenging time, but I think there are solutions to it. Yeah, totally agree with Mark there. I think having those champions in your school, those people that they can go to immediately, is really helpful. And obviously we're in a different position because we've got lots of schools um, globally. So we actually have a team that, that people drop in and out of with their subjects as well. So they ask each other. And it's great the fact that they feel comfortable in, in doing that. But then you've got those people that maybe don't even feel comfortable doing that because they think that their, their tech ability, if you will, isn't at the stage that they'd like to put it in an open forum. Um, and, and part of that is that's what my role involves. So they will quite often just drop me a message. And that's where I find using um, screen recordings really quick for a quick guide of how they can do something. But it's, I think the hardest part is getting them to, um, to open up and feel comfortable in, in saying that they aren't sure, but then it's my job to reassure them that actually, you know, focus on one one feature. Don't try and do everything in one go. Get good at one thing, and then you can start building on that. You don't have to be an expert in everything. I can't I can't teach languages. Um, you know, there's there's no way I'd be fearful of doing that. So stick me in a class of thirty kids and ask me to speak French, I'd be lost. But you know, that's the position that we're putting them in, asking them to use technology with in front of their students. And I think it's, that's where, as a school, you also need to build in that time for them to get that CPD, but also time to experiment where it's not in the classroom, where they can they can practice, have like a digital playground that they can go and try new things out on, 
where it's a safe, secure area, uh, rather than them just doing it directly and it, you, you're going live with your students. It, it's giving them that balance of, here's a little playground area, a little secure space where you can ask questions, you can make mistakes, try things out, but just focus on one thing at a time. Yeah, I think Donna's right. I think it's about managing expectations, definitely, and about kind of senior leaders understanding that particularly over the last year with everything that's going on, it's a process and things aren't going to necessarily fall into place instantly for every member of staff uh, and just guiding them through that. And that's that's going to be a really important factor. Yeah, I, I mean, it, I, I'd, I'd agree with, with all of those comments. I, I think, you know, if, you know, the last 10 months has, has, has effectively been placed on everyone and, and we've all had to, you know, skill up <laughs> very very quickly and and you know mm. learn how to interact with with one another as as, as adults uh, via video conferencing let alone you know trying to teach a class of of children through what is in effect a, a video conferencing suite that ordinarily actually wasn't designed for what we've been intending to use it for for the last 10 months so my you know hat goes off to anybody you know that, that has built something that they have you know a mastered in a short period of time but you know look i mean everybody's skills and experiences are different and i think the most important advice that anyone can give is is don't try to do something you know that you're not comfortable with um you know from from minute one you know it, it delivery of, of a lesson digitally you know is far more effective when you're using the skills you know that, that you that you've built up and you're comfortable with um you know, I, I, interesting, I would love to see what's going to happen with the digital world of teaching and collaboration over the next few years. Um, my observation in the market is that there's way too many collaboration platforms, um, you know, for, to, to choose from. And it's actually very confusing as to what do you standardize on? Because once you've made that decision, it's quite difficult to reverse that decision. Um, and you know, I, I think the other bit of advice, therefore, is is speak to other um, schools that that have been on that that journey, and to understand you know the benefits of Teams over Zoom, over over WebEx, um, you know, over a uh, Google um, Classroom, etc., and make the decision that's right for you, your your, your staff, uh, and the and the students, and importantly, something that parents will be familiar with uh, as well. Um, I won't comment on the ones that I've had to download in a hurry for my children and then, um, you know, tear my hair out uh, with two minutes into a lesson. So I think standardization, familiarization and um, and making sure that you work within your comfort zone is, is critical. Yeah, I think just reflecting on what Neil said there, the, the one thing that really does stress teachers out and upset teachers is, is having to learn a new platform having only just learned another platform say six weeks two months three months previously and sort of constant innovations that are out there and it is about having that sort of strategic vision as to mm. which direction you're going to go in and then backing that and sticking with it um still allowing for creativity um but it's about choosing that as neil says there's lots of collaboration platforms out there but choosing that platform that's going to be your kind of central focus um, and for us it's been microsoft teams and OneNote. Um, and we've built everything around that over the last 12 months or so, um, particularly. Um, and there is still room for creativity beyond that, but it's about having that central focus so that you're not constantly saying to teachers, oh, right, we've got this and you need to learn this and oh, here's something else, it's great, give this a go. Um, they can do that if they want to, but you've got to have that strategic vision that gives them a little bit of consistency. Yeah, I must admit when um, we started our protocol, it was up to year two. So like seven year olds were using Seesaw as their platform. And then it was was Microsoft products and Teams from, from up above. But as an adult, um, when I started at uni in September, oh my goodness me, I had to learn Blackboard. And I do it once a week and it puts the fear into me every week. And I've got another session on it tonight. And I'm just looking forward to January when we do our new module and we're on Teams and I will be happy. So for all people out there, yes, I work in tech. Yes, I'm a so-called um, expert in things but I still get the same gist as every time I go on because I know somebody's going to ask me to do something and I'm not sure how to do it as a student. So putting myself in that place, I certainly know and, and, and feel exactly the same. So sticking to that one platform definitely, Neil, is the, the way forward. Make, make the decision and, and stick to it and know why you're making that decision as well. 
I love everything I'm hearing. Manisha, I didn't know if you wanted to add on to that before I move on to our, our final few minutes. There was just, I mean, there's only one other thing that I thought, and, and it's kind of being raised here, is I, I just think it's a, a huge opportunity right now for um, for what, what the way of educating around digital and its practical application as we're doing it can now unfold. And, and I think we've got to keep that in, in the full view as well. You know, I know it's challenging, it's difficult. It really is, but that's because of the pace we've got to go out to get where we've got to now. And I worry sometimes we don't celebrate the fact that we've got there. We have actually moved so quickly mm. far forward. And, you know, corporates are doing exactly the same thing. We are having to go through huge consolidations and movement. And I almost think there's a bigger picture here that we could look to of saying right the way from, a, a you know, an entry level of education through to your career, there are things that are now going to be in play for both sides that we can all start to come around and, and look at. And that blended approach of learning and lifelong learning, more importantly, that we're talking about with whether it be digital skills or just STEM or anything, I think it's the practice of that actually has a, a real opportunity to, to flow and develop here. And that is, that's the opportunity, which for me is, is unbelievable right now. And we've, we've shown it. The tenacity that everyone's had to go through to get here, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. A resilience. We are coming up on an incredible amount of resilience, I'd say. Um, Neil, I know we were chatting earlier and you had some, you know, you were sharing some success stories. I don't know if you wanted to pick out a success story to share before we uh, close up today, but uh, we'd love to hear how, you know, you've already shared quite a bit, you know, standardization, familiarization, etc. cetera. Uh, any of the stories um, from HP uh, to add uh, to, uh, to the success in this new normal? Oh, well, thanks for, for putting me on the spot there, Georgina um, Crumbs. Uh, so, uh, well, actually, this is quite a, a fitting one um, because we, we have Donna on the call. Uh, and and that, th this is actually purely coincidental. Um, but, you know, HP and Cognita have worked together for, you know, the, the last, um, you know, couple of years. And, and, you know, one of the things that, you know, and I, I'm just going to put Cognita in, in a bit of a shining light here. And I know a, a lot of, um, you know, schools and, and colleges and, and trusts do this. But, you know, one of the things that we really love is, is not just having to turn up with, you know, a price uh, for a volume of laptops that that you know somebody wants to buy well you know that that's what value can the technology provider you know put into a, a project um unless what we're asked to do is feel bold as a as a community and say look i want to buy you know 50 laptops for my school what value are you the manufacturer or the the the, the installer the reseller going to provide in order to win that business. It's exactly what Cognita um, uh, did to us. Um, and uh, thankfully we, we, worked, we, we, you know, we were successful in that, in that project because we said, we'll turn up on, on, on day one, we will teach the staff all the familiarization around the technology so that it isn't a real bind when it comes to, to, to transitioning from the old tech to the new tech. We will stay there and we will educate a, a, a group of lighthouse um, uh, lead tech leaders, and a lot of them were students and staff, and they act as the as the troubleshooters in the schools, and then we can deliver video com uh, uh, content to, you know, educate people around the technology and and, and how to use it, uh, particularly in collaboration with with Microsoft, where you know Teams, you know, plays a very big role along with OneNote for classroom and, and, and so on. And, you know, I think, you know, all of you, you know, I know the budgets are tight, but, you know, when the opportunity comes, please make sure that you put uh, the pressure on your suppliers to add value uh, to the valuable, um, the valuable investments that, that you're putting in. Um, we will respond positively, and I think you'll be surprised by the, um, the responses and the value that, that we can all provide as a tech community. 
Well, I love that. Thank you for running with the on the spot, uh, Neil. I know you shared so many more, so that was wonderful. And that leads on really nicely, value being key, right? Everything has to have value and meaning, authenticity, et cetera. So maybe we can just do a final round around the uh, virtual table today, just on some final thoughts on what you feel the future is for speaking digital. Who would like to kick us off after Neil's lovely lead? Any final thoughts? Well, I think the key is that we're not going to go backwards, are we? The, the situation that we're in now with everything that's gone on, things are only going to continue to go in a digital direction. And we need to make sure that we continue to support our people uh, and our staff, as a lot of people in the chat have been saying, uh, moving forward. Um, and, and just the message that it is possible uh, from a school that is in a fortunate position to have had one-to-one -one devices for quite a while, um, it is possible to, to make that journey to, to empower your people and your staff to achieve some really, really great things um, on a digital level, definitely. And I, I think moving forward, just to add to that as well, is that time has got to be invested in this continuously, not just initially, at the initial stages when you maybe get new devices, when new, new platforms and technologies are introduced to you, because these things do change over time, so it's allowing staff time periodically throughout the year on a year on year because you will start investing into into new tech you will start spending getting new technologies in there that staff need to become familiar with uh, and students so it's making sure that it's an ongoing process of, of for your cpd and that there's some way that you can tap into what's available already because you're not rewriting the wheel there's going to be people out there so make use of, of things like twitter make use of your personal learning network and just tap into what you can because it's out there wherever you are on the globe you can tap into something somewhere put a question on twitter and you can guarantee somebody will support you within minutes I love that. This PLN is so important that professional learning network so I couldn't agree more Donna. Manisha what would you like to add on for your final thoughts for speaking digital? I, I, I go back to try and make it fun try and make it feel different and engage I, I worry sometimes we get so bored into the hard the difficult hardness of it all that we forget that we're all making great strides and forward progress even if it doesn't feel like it and it's surprising how just a simple notion of i now know how to do copy and paste using the keys or whatever you know even the basics can actually make somebody else go oh it's not just me then great right i'm going to give it another go and and I think the human stories have to play out here. And if you can connect people through that medium, whatever channel you use, it just it will allow it to fly because people get connected by people's stories. And I just I just worry sometimes we get so boiled into the actual nitty gritty of the technology that you forget that this is a this is as much a transformation of what we do and how we do it as it is the technology we're having to use to get it done by. So that's that would be my only addition. It's a brilliant addition. I would also like to add celebration. So just as all of you have been celebrating your peers, your communities, uh, we had lots of celebration in the chat. I guess my big share to add to all of the wonderful advice and expertise that's been passed around is to make sure as an educator, as well as a leader and an admin, that every every step that's taken towards the new normal is celebrated. The more that you celebrate, the more that you encourage and build that confidence to take those risks. And as Manisha just shared, you're then also empowering them to share their digital story in meaningful and authentic ways. So celebrate, celebrate, and uh, the progress will skyrocket for sure. And with that final, um, Neil, sorry, I should pass it back to you. Did you want to add anything, any last sparkle to the uh, conversation before I pass it back to our our lovely bet host no just thank you thank you to to everyone in, in indeed and and particularly thanks for to everyone that's, that's been on the, the the chat pages um and, and just commenting there final thing for me is um is if, if you click on the handouts link there is a you know a really interesting guide uh, around you know unlocking student potential uh, and make sure you look at hp refresh for education because uh that will change your life and it will change the lives of many people by being able to re-image old devices with Windows 10 and you can do it on any machine. It's not about HP, it's about the whole world. Mm -hmm. 
everything that's ever been produced and getting more tech into kids' hands, which is the, the, the main thing to do over the, the coming months and years. I love that. What a brilliant way to end the session. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it back over to our wonderful uh, bet hostess, Elle, uh, who'd like to close up. But a big thank you from myself. Hi, exactly, guys. Thank you so much to all of our fantastic speakers for sharing their stories today. Um, and yeah, special thanks as well to HP for supporting this BetCast. Um, and thanks to everybody who attended and took part in the chat. It was great, as the speakers have said, to see you guys talking um, and sharing some great ideas too. Um, so hopefully everybody's enjoyed today's webinar. And yeah, we look forward to seeing you all next time. Um, but for now, bye from the BET team.